Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the canyon. This is the indoor part of it. Welcome back to the third installment of the Spider Build Chronicles, uh, which I think encompasses bags C, D, and E. Uh, we, in episode one, built these. Uh, they they have those. Uh, I, I assembled that universal part. That is uh, perhaps if one of the most, if not the most questionable decision that G made chose was the, the, the part of the universal is actually the shaft that the pinion gear is attached to. So do you want to change your tribe shafts? Too bad. You can't do that. So they, like, when you take it apart, they, that, that's where they go right there. They do do a nice belt and suspenders job where there is a, there's a three by three set screw in there. And then this slides over the pin as well. So even if the set screw came loose and fell out, your drive shaft wouldn't come apart. So it's a, it's a well thought out drive shaft. It's just, why don't they use a yoke? Yoke. Why don't they use this on both sides? I don't know. I don't know. Episode B, we built this. Episode B. Uh, the gearbox. Uh, the only thing that has been done is I went back to the step, which was a couple steps back, and attached the linkage for the two-speed. Other than that, it's been sitting on the bench waiting for today. So, we'll run down... This is This is bugging me. We'll run down what was done. I assembled the Shocky Boys, and I think they finally stopped leaking. Uh, and I think what happens is the way the O-ring land fits onto the cap, uh, some oil gets up in between that little groove, and it will just keep burbling oil for a little while. I think they're mostly all clean. They're mostly all clean at the top now. They go together pretty well. Nice seals, everything. Uh, you will notice these springs, to some, might look familiar. Those are indeed incision 13 by 54. These are stock Phoenix springs, 2.1 pounds, pounds per inch. Because after I removed these from the plastic and cleaned them up, they were completely coated. Uh, they're still a bit on there. They were completely coated in what appeared to be mineral oil. Uh, these are 13 by 55, appropriately close, but we put them on the little homebrew shock dyno here, and they are a full four pounds per inch. Uh, when this rig is completed, I'm going to be surprised if it's even five pounds. 2.1 pounds per inch might be too firm. This, these are unquestionably too firm. Even if the shocks were laid down at a 45 degree angle, which they are not, uh, that would be really, really stiff. We assembled these. It's extremely straightforward. You take this and you insert the big set screws into each one, and then you tighten them down until they're basically facing the same direction, and then you're done. That's it, you just do it a bunch of times. The only one that's different is the Panhard, this little crinkle boy, and you use the shock. These are the same rod ends that come on the shock sprue to build those, nothing overly complicated. They are nice in that if it's got a groove in it, uh, they've got the grooves each end. That's a lower link, and the ones without grooves are upper links. Pretty straightforward. The only non-straightforward part is that for whatever reason, in their infinite, in their infinite wisdom, you've got this one that has two very short ends on it. So it uses the only two M4 by 15 set screws. Everything else is M4 by 20. And if you'll notice, those are very nearly the same length. They could have just used this rod twice with the two ends. I don't know why they didn't. Again, G-made decisions, made by G-made people, and uh, we arrive where we arrive. So we've got chassis to do. I haven't even grabbed bag C. It is up. No, no I took that back. I did grab bag C. Oh, rails are in there. We have somewhat arbitrarily chosen servos. 
Uh, this Reefs 422 was at the top of the servo, bo the servo box. And then we were looking for a two-speed servo that will go in this bracket right here. We were digging through the bin and digging through the bin, and we said, what servo is in here in the greatest number? And the answer to that is the Reedy 1523, which is, uh, you know, of the things they give us that have Reedy stamped on them, honestly, the Reedy 1523 is not that bad. It is not overwhelmingly capable as a steering servo when it is put into a servo on actual application it will actually kind of work like you don't need to pull it out immediately you can run it you'll probably burn it out before before you you decide that it doesn't make enough power but for shifting a two speed that's why we don't throw servos like that away oe steering servos are tailor-made shift and dig servos. There's that, there's that battery tray. Wow. I don't know what those are. I want to find out what those are. And we've got sides and a, looks like a receiver box. There's a two speed bracket, some foams, a battery strap. And then we've got the distinctly 10 to looking rails. Could we potentially get to where we at least have a roller? Like we can slide the, the 1905s are still sitting right over there on the bench. Could we potentially get to the point where this thing will stand under its own weight? Maybe. Maybe. No promises. Let us get that 422 in place. I'm afraid to, yeah. I've had to dig into the discard box uh, an uncomfortable number of times. I keep thinking, oh, I don't need that. It's mostly the little metal pins. And hopefully, today will be a day bereft of metal pins. Okay. 22 again servo manufacturers are only happy when we have the wire on the servo pointing out the front we've got to get into the bags into the i'm ru i'm rustling in the pile of bags nope those are flathead the temptation here is to break free of our slavery to the bags and uh it's right behind me it's right behind me. It's lurking. The the bins, the endless bottomless bins we have of fasteners of all types and sizes, 2.5, 3 millimeter, 4 millimeter. They use a little, uh, they use a little hat guy, which I guess is a viable alternative to just using the specialized, the, the big head, the big head bolts. What most people are using for servo a fixing. I mean, this works. It's just the extra little step. The ex, you know, the extra little step. And I'm gonna have to get these. I, I, I have them. Long running air. Don't never tighten these down all the way, because there's enough play in the system to get the servo kicked off at an angle. And then you're like, why can't I get this thing to center? Like my steering acts weird. It's because the servo's clocked to one side ever so slightly. Because this thing is the GSO2F with a very forward motor orientation, the servo tray is again very very bespokeified. You cannot you cannot change this out for anything else because on the side that is not the servo is the big groove where the motor sits. I personally, and I, I say this as, so now we gotta try to make sure we get this at least straight-ish. Uh, I don't really understand the exceptionally forward motor movement. I think more rigs here have forward motors than don't. I like a nice three gear, put the motor in a midship, get it down a little lower. I mean, I re, I, I realize, I recognize and I understand that we can't we can't VFD everything, 
I mean, it would be nice. Now, the question is, where in the world, we're never going to find Carmen San Diego, but what we can hope to find is the servo horn. And the servo horn is on a sprue tree. I was hoping for non-plastic, so uh, it's the it's the inner hole. It measures up uh, precisely to an Amazon servo horn. So, what we do in that situation is we get ourselves. We'll just grab one out of the bins. We get ourselves. That's not the right bin. We get ourselves like say an M three by ten, and we tighten it up just enough to hold the horn on so it doesn't fall off. And we hope to remind ourselves that, well, we can try to check for center. Okay, so centered is about... So what we do is we try to find the approximate center of the servo. Yeah, that's the plastic horn. Would you like to know why? Because we, we get vanquished. I think, I think it's zero. I think it's zero clearance. I don't know if you could slip a sheet of, uh, let's see, it's zero clearance. So the other horn being longer, we would have to cut it to fit. So we get an approximate centering and we'll call that. So uh, again, much like you can only use this fastener here and that fastener there, that horn, if you're going to replace that horn, you have to replace it with a horn that is that precise length. It can be no longer than, uh, this one is 29 outside to outside, and it is 20 millimeters center hole to center hole. That's not uncommon. Like a Vanquish horn would fit on there, so definitely Vanquished again. Now, there was, like, there's a ball. There's a cat. There's just, again, mark this down on your bingo sheet of parts that occur on the G-Made Spider just a single time, just one time. And this is a, a broached ball stud, and it is yet another one, and it is retained by an M3 non-lock nut. This one does not qualify for bingo status because there are three of them. And I, I, I'm, I support this, the use of a lock nut to screw it into because then we're just not we're not just driving it into into plastic. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be able to have steering. It looks like they have us assemble quite a lot of holy moly. Alright. <laughs> I caught a glimpse. Uh the holy moly was this appears to be the front bumper mount. But that's the rear bumper. Wow. Why? Wow, maybe that doesn't get used in here. Why are you so wide? I haven't, you know, we, we make every effort not to read ahead, but I'm supposed to attach to that a little thing that has two vertical holes in it. I don't see that bit. I don't see that bit. If somebody's using their eyes. I don't see that. 6254, number 17. As the SpongeBob announcer would say, several minutes later. Uh, 6254 resides inside GM57014, the G bag. It's, it's right there. Not on the tree that one would anticipate. I looked through, uh, I was looking for 6254. I was not finding 6254. <laughs> Again, the descent into madness continues, fueled by G Made. And I had developed this sneaking suspicion. I was like, that has to be important. I feel like probably front body mount because they tout invisible front body mount. Where do they put the... Okay. Let's try to keep the, the semi-assembled pieces together because we are about to enter 
the G Main Zone. Uh, brace yourself as all one step. Uh, if in a single step you have to put on, let me let me do it. Let me get a rough count here: five, six, seven, eight. I think we're putting in sixteen screws, six nuts, all in one, all in one giggity go. Most places will tell you that they'll just hop straight at you and they'll be like. Assemble this side first, and then and then bolt the sides together. G made is like, no, we got you, bro. Just uh, just start just start slapping pieces together. So you know what we do around here? We start slapping pieces together. And three by eight on your separate on your second bingo card. Please do keep track of how many different length fasteners we're going to use. It is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, it is PTSD, axial field PTSD from, from cages where they're like, we're just going to use every available length. That looks like it goes right there. That's the nice about these little arched front ends on chassis rails. There's really There's really only one way for it to go. But we've got to get this guy in here first. Just. Then we need an M3 by 10. We definitely have those. The fun part of this operation for me is always seeing uh, what the panhard situation. They're not. They're not fooling around. That is. It's gotta be way up around 85. Mm, yeah, 87. Got an 87 millimeter wide chassis plate. I think a lot of companies now are are doing something unnecessary, which is they're making their chassis plates too small. Okay, this is definitely handed. That look that looks correct with the holes more towards the front. We're just gonna go with that. And we have no fasteners going into the center plate yet because it's just pins retaining it for now. Oh, the, I, I, I know that piece. I know that piece. Where'd you go? The, the, chassis, the chassis plate at the back of this is an absolute chonker. Four servos worth. And again, slightly handed. It's got two holes in it. And this is the one that is loaded with a bunch of lock nuts. I feel like I just saw lock nuts. Oh, and M3 by 10s. Yeah, we can do that. Then, of course, the adventure portion of this. Adventure! Is these just rest in there, the lock nuts. If you turn this at any amount of angle, they'll just fall out. So we try to get the pieces, we try to get the sides on with as few... Falling. That's this okay, okay, okay. Holes to the back. Holes to the back. So far, so good. Okay, now just whatever we do, don't invert that. Do not, do not invert. And we need this, the flush cutter again. Lost it. All right. We've got a little, we've got a decorative piece. I'm not 100% sure that with a tray that big we actually need a chassis brace back there. Yeah, that is, that is wild. There's a, it might be my first experience of front pinch with no, apparently no, uh, no rear pinch. Like two millimeters? This is 85. That's the typical width of a wide skid. They, uh, what I like to operate by is the assumption that they know more than I do. So we just, we roll with it. We're going to go through a bunch. Don't invert it. We roll through. Oh, this guy's big. Spider big. We're just going to roll with it. Are you sure you want a 10 there? Yeah, you do. Because they want a nut on it. A lot of belt and suspenders action 
on the spider. Because that threads through pretty well. Oh, I almost inverted. Don't invert. Do not invert. I probably could have put this nut on after we get the other side in, but I wanted to get this nut on before I put the other bracket in. Again, the temptation is to question when, I mean, let's, let's operate from some assumption that things happen for a reason. This guy goes in because it is what the shock towers attach to. So bracing, unbracing, unbracing, and we're not going to be able to see that brace. So again, questionable, three by ten flatheads. I am going to, you know what? I feel like I'm getting too deep into the ramble. Let me, let me get this. All right, we'll get a shock tower on. I'll give you that much. The shock towers, okay, they are different. So the front are the whole more in line, and the rear are the ones that are kicked over. So yeah, this one is here. Let me get a shock tower put on, being careful not to invert. It is skip a hole through there. Skip a hole through there. Yeah, I need, I need a third hand. I need, I need to transform into an octopus for this operation. I like to take you along for the journey, but stuff just keeps falling out. So I'm going to get that other side of the rail in. And then we'll have, we'll have this, but with two sides. And then... Did I put the front one on? Yeah, I couldn't. I, uh, we will discuss. And really, it, it's not too bad. It, it's it's pretty straightforward. Look, look at look at that line angle. That's that's a fairly typical. No, that's more than a typical front pinch, and like no pinch in the rear. I mean, I run a lot of no pinch chassis, so maybe it's not explicitly necessary. It just looks. It looks unusual. We get to more G-made stuff, which is mounting the skirts and the mount for the two-speed. We're going to use four different lengths of servo of screws. We're going to use 110. This is the hardest part for me. So it's the foremost hole in the skid, yes, into that hole there. So we're going to put in a 10, and then this side gets two eights, and that goes into this hole, and this hole. It just, this is stuff that I think about when, when I start to think about serviceability way down the line. You have to have your, you have to have your screw bin oriented, so nothing goes into that one. And, you know, I mean, just split the page into two steps. Explain it to me like I'm five. There's where the upper link goes, so we don't want to go into that hole. So an eight goes in there. And then see, then they do stuff that's just fantastic, which is there's a little nib and then a hole. So you can't do it wrong. There's a, there's a matching hole. And this pops into that little hole just like that. So the two-speed mount uses the 15, but it's just intuitive. It has to be, it has to be what I call designed by committee. Because some of it just makes a lot of sense. And then some of it goes, makes you go, why would they do this to me? The chassis is definitely going together with a, a greater degree of ease than was experienced on either the axles or the gearbox. Uh, now, uh, steps 42 and 43 are attaching these and the ones that are right behind me on the bench. They're going to go on the gearbox. Oh, we want, they want them on the gearbox. They want them on the gearbox. 
and it looks like long I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie no 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 lying here I cannot judge by this picture so I was careful to, to, to pick the correct ones the that and by that I mean this and this look to be almost the same length so the one for the rear is the four, which is the longer one, which is this one. So I'm guessing that the the rear axle is pushed back even further than it appears at first glance, because that means that the rear drive shaft on this is almost remarkably long relative to the front. And it's not as if we're skid forward particularly. It'd be it would be it would be tough to get very skid forward with a gearbox this long. Once we have our uh, our, our wangly dangly drive shafts in place, I think this would almost classify as a bingo because we get the gearbox settled down right there, and the lower part of the gearbox is M3 by 12 flathead up through the bottom, just two screws through the bottom. Thusly, and those two, there's the second one, these two gentlemen are the only M3 by 12 flatheads that occur on the vehicle. And then, we have one of the rare occasions where you actually have to shift to a 2.5. Well, we need the 2.5 a bunch to put the links together. But these are M3 by 8 big socket heads to hold the front of the gearbox in place. And I feel like the way I feel like the the gearbox is almost like is almost like a structural component. Because everything starts to get real solid when you put more of that in there. You know, when you look at it now, it it does that that's fairly low. Everything is pretty tight in the chassis. I still have high hopes for where the three by eights go. I still have high hopes for the performance. I, I, I well and truly do because we, we need to get that we need to get that ROI. Okay, there's two there's a little waste on it. And the electronics box is all the way back here on this giant plank. And I think the fat is the correct orientation. And with that, the, the chassis is largely assembled. And that brings us to the link phase. And they work front to back, as do most. And this is a section where, folks, I got I to gotta do what I got to do. Um, we're looking at, looks like 20s. The front upper is a 20. Uh, with a button head, the front lowers are a 25 with a socket cap, and then the rears are the same. Button head 20s for the uppers, socket cap 25 for the lowers. So we're mounting seven links, and then we're going to slap the axles onto it. And then we're going to find out if we put the drive shafts on correctly. So, yeah, we're, we are, we've got, we are currently on step 46 of the chassis. Uh, at step 41, we start putting cosmetic pieces on, like the fenders. So for today, we're, uh, did I say 41? I'm, what I meant is 52 fenders go on. So we're going to, the, the, the goal here is 46 to 51. Stick some wheels on it so we can at least set it down. I don't think we're going to be able to put power under it because let me, let me scan ahead a little bit. Yeah, we got to get the steering servo oriented. Uh, we can't put the shocks on until the fenders are on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They have kind of a weird build order. So let's see, let's see what we've got. Now I don't remember what link is what. Steering. This is the front upper. And then the rear uppers are these. And 
Those are the rear lowers, and these are the front lowers. Yeah, all right. Okay. Uno, momento, a por favor. And because I am just outright committed to getting this thing to where we can at least roll it back and forth, perhaps not put power to it. I doubt we're going to be able to put power to it. Uh, I haven't... We just installed the seven links. And uppers, pew, lowers. The fitment of the ball between those is... I would take this automotive trim tool and I would get it between there and I would wiggle it back and forth to try to loosen the plastic enough to get it in there. The tolerance is zero. Our good friend, zero tolerance. Let us get the pan heart in and hopefully nothing flops about enough to release the drive shafts from their, their place of captivity. I think I have the fasteners required set out because I omitted some steps or omitted showing you some steps. I hope that I have it put together in such a way that we can we can do this all at once. I do have some I have some concerns about not just a single sheer pan hard but a panhard that is just a little nub that comes off the side of the C-Hub. Uh, maybe it's fine. What, what are we looking at? It's fairly straight. It's got a, you know, it's not, it's not candy coat. It's got a little bit of swing to the axle. But more often than not, axle swing isn't, this is wildly perceptible. I think that's right. We want a 30. Because we're just... Are we stacking? No. We're not stacking. Just right there. Just right there. All right. Let's see. That was the fitment that I had prayed for on the lower link mounts. That just pops right in there. That's, that's what I like to see. 25 on one side. Oh, also, uh, if you're following along on your bingo card, there is an M3 by 15 flathead that attaches the chassis side of the panhard bar. And it is singular. It is the only M3 by 15 flathead on the vehicle. Now, if we pop this on to the one ball stud that we've got, Hopefully that will keep things from falling too loose. Let's uh, let's grab a let's get these cords out of the way and grab a measurement. What are we looking at here? Thirty-eight. Uh, how do we make sure our panhards are the correct length? We measure from the side of the chassis. Like at full compression, full compression isn't your best spot to choose from. It's best to do it at right end. Yeah, thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. So at full squish, we uh, the panhard length and the drag length length uh, do indeed appear to be centered. And the servo will be very lightly out of center, but sometimes the horn doesn't get you or we're not dead center on attaching it. Will we be able to unbolt that? Not a chance. The screw that attaches the horn is directly on top of of the of the panhard bar, the chassis said panhard, it goes it goes right over the top of it. So, I mean, on a Traxxas, it's right behind the axle. You have no chance of getting it to it there either. So I have separated the fenders from their bits and bobs. I do believe this is this side. And when I looked at the fenders a little more closely, I said, this looks like something that can be done successfully and if it can then we shall and then we'll be able to get the well that popped right off Oof. you gotta you have to be a contortionist to get these on every time I think that things are are gonna are gonna go my way I get a uh, I get I get G mated. 
hard. I just spent, it had to be 10 minutes, trying to gather the necessary pieces to get the shocks on. And then, and this is on me, I couldn't remember where I had put the wheel hexes. So I was trying to find those. I'm now trying to leaf back to page 38. What? So glad I leafed back to page 38. You, generally, if there's a spacer, that goes on the inside, but I guess they want it used so that the shock can't fall off. I mean, you could just do that by flipping the thing around. Anyway, not, I'm not in the mood to second guess anymore. Front shock absorber is in the rear upper hole. Using 18s and the lower, the front lowers for some reason use a 12, but the rear lowers use a 15. At some point, at some point today, uh, it became the, the fulfillment of the inevitable that I'm going to be able to, I'm going to set wheels under this. We're going to bolt tires on, and then it will sit. And I can tell you now, looking at what is left over in terms of parts, like what all is involved in the body, I don't believe that the body is overwhelmingly heavy. It doesn't look super large to me or anything. It's going to be certainly is going to be lighter than the CJ7, and I did re uh, I do recall with some degree of accuracy that when I was assembling the axles, I said this is my least favorite kind of wheel hex that there is because they're they're loose to the point where they fall off. If you if you stop if you take your eyes off of them for more than a few moments, they will just fall off. Uh, I stand by that. But I have what I would consider to be a small bucket of wheel hexes. And I dug through that wheel, that bucket of clamping wheel hexes, in a sincere effort to find any wheel hex that would fit these axles and was unable to do so. I want tires on this so that for the rest of it, the, bolting the rest of it together, I, I can at least set it on the ground. Incomplete thought from before. There's no way that body weighs enough for uh, these springs to be correct. We are going to need to go down in weight more. More. Put sugar in water. Uh, Two pound an inch, not atypical. It's like what we'd see on the back of an Elm, we'll see Elm Blues, or in that like two pound range. Uh, Traxxas. Orange? Orange? Maybe? White? Orange? Uh, yeah, a two pound, 2.1 per pound per inch spring is not uncommon. Four pound, on the other hand, which are what the vehicle came equipped with, or came in the kit. That's like IFS stuff. That's that's the spring rate normally associated with cantilevers. I don't know if anything in the canyon is running a spring heavier than even three pounds per inch. And there's no way that's all. That is a wheelbase. Uh, there's no way it's going to need to run fours. So we're going to have to source from the spring wall springs, but the 2.1s are the right length. And it will allow us to say, yeah. <laughs> they feel very, very stiff. Uh, we cannot mount the two-speed servo because 
once you mount it, the, the horn is effectively inaccessible. So we've got to, oh my God. I would want this to sit basically all the way down. And it is, yeah, the body might take it to there. Okay. It's not a big flexor because I neglected to point this out earlier. My apologies. Uncompressed eye to eye. The rear shocks are 85s. But on that 85, we've got about, well, we've got 20 millimeters of shaft exposed. And then fully compressed, the shock collapses down to about 65. So yeah, that's, it's 20 millimeters. That's not, that's not unusual for a shock of that length. Uh, you would just think, oh, that is, it is violently oversprung in the rear at two pounds. And it came with four. This needs like a one pound per inch spring in the back. It might end up being a necessity that we task Amazon and perhaps put these shafts inside a set of Amazon fake drab techs because we need a shock. I think the softest I've got is 1.3 pound in a spring of this size. I might have some element greens, which are point... Is it still on the board? No, grays are 1.4. Yeah, blues are 2.1. Uh, I think the gr element greens are under a pound. That might that might work for the rear. That is insane. Um, no, not quite. We've got all. There's 80 weight in the shocks. There's just enough damping. If it was a little, slightly tiny bit more under damped, we could use the the rear of it as a catapult. It is full. There's no. There's no settle at all, and that is half the rate that it came with. I am still, you know, I remain for whatever inexplicable reason hopeful. Yeah, three, yeah, almost 345. Wheelbase is not dynamic. It doesn't really change through the stroke. The, yeah, that is straight up and down. So good stuff. The geometry looks pretty good. I'm surprised with how little flex there is, but maybe it's designed that way. The tracks just build stuff for low flex. So we're not going to hold that against it. What we are going to hold it against it is, what, a, guys, what are you doing? And actually, because that rear end is pushed back so far for, for, for back, uh, it is it is a little, it's a little bit skid forward. We've got a pretty stout link back there, and that's pretty short. So... We will have hopes of the performance. I will probably just, uh, like, I don't know if we'll be able to ghost ride because the body has a bunch of stuff. And yeah, there's the front body mount. So that has to be mounted to the body. The body's got to be fully cut out. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea what the future holds for us because that is going to be a one color body. We've got to get electronics put into it. Oh, and yes, I would indeed be remiss here in the close of episode three. If I did not point out, let's put this bin away. Let's get a little bit of stuff out of the way. We'll, we'll drop this guy off. He can hang out on Susan over here for a moment. Uh, so we will be using that. Those are the two pieces of the receiver box. Correct. Uh, I don't think we use anything else off of this. I don't think we use anything else off of this. This is the battery tray. So at most, we might use this piece. But we use part of that. Uh, we don't use those. Or that. Or any of that. Or any of this. Or any of these. And there's more. There's more little bits scattered around the bench. Uh, and that is... For me, that is, I, I can, some things I can forgive, and I know that there are cough cutting measures here and cough saving measures there, but 
We're talking a lot of universal sprue trees. Not altogether surprising as the GS the G GSO2F comes in 17 different flavors. But I'm a kit guy. I I push for kits. Kits, kits, and more kits. Uh, this is an opportunity where I'm quite thankful that Buffalo Bill uh, showed up pre-built. Because it would be almost enough to make me go, G-Made, G-Made, why? But then again, the rocks are the grand determiner. We'll see how this looks. Yeah, it's not. It is not heavy. It's not heavy. The spider. We'll get spidered. Uh, throw some ideas in the comments for what single color paint job. Um, and that that's not necessarily the wheel. Those were the wheels they were tested on. But uh, throw throw something out there. I was thinking orange, maybe maybe orange. But then I was thinking maybe white, uh, maybe gray. I don't know. If anybody had one, where is it? Right here. I'm going to cut this out, and I'm going to paint this one color, and then I will probably do the, the cutout right here and do the bed black, but that, that's it. No, no, other, no other tomfoolery. I'm wondering how this cooperates with, with this. Oh, it just goes in from the back. Of course, they don't have any masks for these. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe we should just ghost ride it, like full ghost ride, like a no body ghost ride, and then we can determine whether or not I feel motivated to put more colors into the paint. We'll get to that when we get to that. Every time I work on the G-Made Spider, I need like a day to recover from working on the G-Made Spider. So you'll see it again in a few days-ish, and we'll go from there. I'll, I'll, maybe in the meantime, I'll try to suss something out in terms of springing for this because violently oversprung at two pounds. All right. Thank you so much for hanging out while we, while we put things together. Uh, even if you find stuff that frustrates you during the uh, assembly, construction, or whatever of your, of your toy car of choice on that day, still a pretty good day. So in that spirit, please... In between now and when we meet again. One and all, do your very best to have a good one, everybody. A good day is better than a bad day. And even a bad day building, and it wasn't that bad. Even a modestly okay-ish day building is still better than working. So, I'll see you in the next one, everybody. Thanks for stopping by. Come on back now. You hear? <laughs>